Good evening. Welcome to the North Jackson Church of Christ for our Sunday evening services. It's good to see everyone here with us tonight. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you come our way, and we want you to know that you're always welcome here at North Jackson. We do try to keep a record of everyone's attendance. We ask our regular members to check in using the light post out or filling out one of the white cards. Visitors, if you could fill out one of the blue cards, we would appreciate that. And those will be picked up at the end of our services here in just a few minutes. Tonight's services are being led by Gary Carter, who will be our song leader tonight. James Biggs will come read a passage from God's Word and then lead us in an opening prayer. And then Caleb Colley will be speaking to us again tonight. And Caleb's lesson tonight is Jesus' miracle at the wedding feast. So we're looking forward to hearing that, and we're looking forward to worshiping together. And we'll start now by singing praises. Two hundred thirty one. <laughs> Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops. After we sing this song, we'll uh, be led in prayer, have our scripture reading and be led in prayer. 800. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above, while the light from the throne shines forth. Wow, we 
Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. Tonight's scripture reading will be taken from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 24 and 25. And that's John 21, verses 24 and 25. This is the disciple who is bearing this witness about these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful for the blessings this day contained, the sunshine. But Father, most importantly, we're thankful for the opportunity to come and to gather as Christians and to worship you. Father, we're thankful for this congregation. We pray for this congregation, for our elders, our shepherds that watch over us. We pray that you continue to give them wisdom, give them guidance. We pray for our ministers and help strengthen them against the attacks of Satan. Father, we pray for those of our members who are sick. Give them comfort and healing. We especially pray for Sister Heath. We'll be with her and the doctors that they may come to a conclusive um, understanding of what's going on and take appropriate steps afterwards. We also ask that you be with Brother David as he prepares for surgery and that that surgery is successful as well. Lord, we're thankful for your word that you breathed into existence, Lord, that was recorded through so many men over such a, a broad time span and almost miraculously we have your word still in this century father we pray and we're thankful for the things that were written before time for the old testament that we through patience and comfort of the scripture that we might have hope for the things that jesus taught in the gospels and the things that the, the apostles and other men recorded to us and, and helped us to understand how to apply christ's teachings in our day-to-day -day lives would help us as we go out into the world to take those things that we learn and to bring glory and honor to your name. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. If you're following along in the book and you'd like to mark the invitation hymn, that's going to be number 23. Before our lesson, uh, let's stand as we sing number 200. 200. <clears throat> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name, praise Jehovah in the
And then let's open our Bibles to John chapter 2, John 2, and tonight we're just going to do a simple study of verses 1 through 11. Those of you who are North Jackson regulars know that we're having a congregational Bible learning initiative for the year 2024, and it's called Footprints of Jesus. We're doing a chronological study of the life of Christ, and the sheet that you got this morning when you entered the building has to do with this subject. Jesus' miracle at the wedding feast. So that will be the subject that you'll study if you follow along this week as we think about each thing that happened in this text and then practical lessons we can learn. So just to boost us into that study, I thought it would be appropriate for us to talk about this passage together tonight. And there are so many lessons we can learn. Just by way of preliminary remarks about this context, think about the fact that in John 1 and 2, John seems to be giving a chronology of the first week of Jesus' ministry, his public ministry. And that was a very busy week of ministry. In fact, you have John preaching against the Jewish authorities and convicting them of their sin. You have John the Baptist publicly announcing that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then we begin to see Jesus draw followers to himself, even apostles. We see that there are two disciples, probably Andrew and John the son of Zebedee, who were John the Baptist's disciples, who then followed Jesus. And then on the next day, we see that there are Andrew and Peter, who co Peter comes to Jesus having been identified, uh, introduced to Jesus by Andrew. And then on the following day, Philip and Nathaniel follow Jesus. The sixth day is not mentioned, but it is implicated in the chronology of the text we're about to read. And then on the seventh day, we have this wedding at Cana of Galilee, where Jesus performs his first public sign. Maybe not the first miracle he ever performed, but the first of his public signs in Galilee. Let's talk about miracles for just a minute and how the Bible denotes these supernatural acts, and then we will get to the text itself. There are three main New Testament Greek words for supernatural deeds. And always remember that that's what a miracle is. It is an effect that cannot be produced by the normal processes of nature. Something that's observable that could not be produced by what typically goes on in nature according to the natural laws. And there are three main words I would like for us to consider. And I've given you the Greek lettering, but it's not hard to see the English words even just observing the Greek letters. And they're all in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. All three of these words you're going to see on the chart. But let's read Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. Could we have that? There we go. How shall we escape? Now bring this passage up because it has all three of the words in it. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? After it was at first spoken to us by the Lord, it was confirmed to us who heard. So the word was spoken first by the Lord, and then it was confirmed as being authoritative. God also bearing them witness or testifying with them. How? In three ways, both by signs and by wonders and miracles, and then the various gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. So look at those three words. First, we see that there is the word for miracle or dunamis in Greek. And this refers to, to a wonder or a mighty work. But it's often translated miracles as performed by Jesus. When, when the gospel writers talk about Jesus' miracles, the word will be dunamis. It's the word from which we get our English word dynamite. So obviously the connotation has to do with power. So Jesus does something that's a work of power. Or in Acts 8.13, for example, Philip goes down to Samaria. And what is it that convinces the Samaritans that this was a message from God? Here's a Jewish man, a person normally thought to be antagonistic towards Samaritans. There was a great bitterness between Samaritans and Jews. And yet here comes a Jewish man from Jerusalem to teach the gospel in Samaria. And when they hear it, they believe it and obey it. It's because he performed dunamis. He performed miracles. And then we have the word teros. 
And that word has to do with wonder or amazement produced on the part of those who see the miracle. So it's an astonishment word. It's interesting that this word is always accompanied by some other, some other word showing that it's not just a naturally wonderful event, but a supernaturally wonderful occurrence. Like to see a mountain. Well, that's a wonderful thing. We stand in awe of the mountains. We're amazed at them. But they're natural. Now, that is, they occur in nature. I hasten to add, though, that if you were here for Jeff Miller's presentation the other night, you see that the ultimate origin of those mountains may well be the flood. It seems like they are produced, uh, were produced by the miracle of the flood. So maybe that's not even the best example. What about redwoods? Redwoods might be a better example. We look at how wonderful those are, how those tall, tall trees. Well, they're wondrous, but they're not miraculous. Sometimes people talk about the miracle of birth. Well, that's a misnomer because births are perfectly natural events. What we mean is that they're wondrous if we use that type of language. But I don't even like to use that type of language about birth because it really denigrates the biblical concept of a wonder or a miracle. So it's not a supernatural event. But what we're talking about here is, as in passages like Acts 14 and verse 3, signs and wonders. So supernatural events. So it's best not to call perfectly natural events miracles because they're not in the biblical sense of the word. And then we also have the word simeon, which refers to a sign. Signs and wonders. And in fact, this miracle we're about to discuss from John 2 is called specifically a sign. The Gospel of John has seven major signs that Jesus performed to demonstrate that he was the Son of God. In fact, at the conclusion of John's Gospel in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he gives the purpose statement for writing his gospel. He said that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of many witnesses, but these are written that you may believe. So if you've got the gospel of John, you have enough miraculous activity on the part of Jesus reliably reported to convince you that he really was who he claimed to be. John says, I have written down these seven main signs, the wedding at Cana being the first occasion when Jesus performed a public sign, these are written that you may believe. Well, think about a sign for a minute. A sign points to some other reality that is the focus. In other words, the significance is not so much the sign itself, but the item to which the sign points. Like what if you're driving down the interstate and you see a sign and the sign says, park this way. You can go to a park and that you might even see a sign that says uh, you have uh, picnic tables there, you got playground equipment, you got restroom facilities, you can learn something about what the park is, but all that's on the sign and it says this way. You exit now, you can go to the park. Well, the main thing is the park and not the sign itself, but the sign is a pointer or a token to show you to the item that's of real interest. And that's how Jesus' signs were. The main point is not that a person gets healed or that grape juice is produced from water or that a fig tree is cursed or whatever the case may be, that Lazarus is raised from the dead. Those are signs to point you to some reality. And what is the reality? Well, John says there in John 20, these are written. These signs are written to point you to the reality that Jesus is who he claimed to be. So that's the significance of the seven signs in the Gospel of John. Having given those preliminaries, let's read our text. And this is very familiar. You've read about this before. Let's just walk through it. We're going to see the wedding and the request and the hour and the command and the miracle and the result. We're going to organize it in that way, just the various stages of what occurs. So first, the wedding. Look at verses 1 and 2. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. This is an event where Jesus and his disciples, maybe not all 12 of them yet, but some of them at least, attended. 
It's in Cana of Galilee, which is an unknown, for sure, uh, unknown location, but it's probably this place that's about 10 miles north of Nazareth. At any rate, it's in Galilee. It's always referred to as Cana of Galilee. It's only mentioned four times in the New Testament, and two of those are here in chapter 2 of John, and it's only in John that Cana of Galilee is mentioned. And so it's probably a real small place, because otherwise you wouldn't need to refer to it as being of of Galilee as it is every single time. I mean, you don't refer to Jerusalem as Jerusalem of Judea, generally speaking, because everybody knew where Jerusalem was. Cana would be sort of an out-of-the-way place where this wedding takes place, and that's where Jesus chooses to perform the first sign. Notice that he goes to a wedding. It's sweet for me to think about Jesus attending a wedding. That shows that he wanted to participate in ordinary social life where he could encourage good things because God set up marriage as a blessed arrangement for the benefit of both parties who are entering into the marriage. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. And Jesus was interested in promoting every good thing that God gave to man. And so he would be perfectly willing to attend a wedding that's God approved, where the people who are entering into the union have God's permission to do it, where it's a a marriage that God sanctions. We know that not every marriage is like that. In 1 Corinthians 7, we can read about a situation where a woman is called an adulteress because she's married to someone to whom she has no right. Marriages that are not God approved are still called marriages in this context. They're just marriages where God hasn't given his permission. God does not approve it. You can't imagine Jesus attending a marriage that would create fornication because two people are entering into it who do not have the right to be marrying one another. Maybe one person has the right to get married, generally speaking, but not to this other person because this other person doesn't have the right according to Jesus' law on marriage. And we've preached on that other times. But Jesus gave his law on marriage in Matthew 19, 9. And we'll study that on other occasions, and you can read it clearly for yourself in that passage. It's very obvious. But for example, today, there will be discussions about should we attend a wedding between two people who are homosexuals? You can't imagine Jesus attending a wedding like that, because that would be to celebrate something that God abhors, according to Romans 1, 26 and 27, and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. So a Christian would have no business going in support of that wedding. Furthermore, you can't imagine Jesus going to a wedding in celebration of a heterosexual couple who have no right to marry one another, because again, that would be to celebrate something that God abhors. And you can read about our prohibition against doing such things in Romans 132, where Paul says that we must not give our hearty endorsement, or we must not support something that God prohibits. So Jesus goes to a wedding ceremony endorsing the marriage that is there and celebrating with those people who are happy. Remember Romans 12, 15 says, weep with those who weep, but also rejoice with those who rejoice. Are we good at that? Are we good at congratulating people who are succeeding in some way or another? Not envying them, but being happy for them and their successes? Maybe somebody gets a promotion at work. We may even think that we should have gotten that promotion, that we were a better employee than that other employee. But Jesus was adept at congratulating people who deserved congratulations. And so even when it's hard, we should be like Jesus and celebrate with those who are in a rightful position to celebrate. So Jesus goes to the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. Next, let's look at the request made by his mother on this occasion. Verse 3, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. We'll talk about what the wine was in just a minute, but let's just notice that Mary has an urgent request in a way. We're going to see in another way it's not so urgent compared to Jesus' overall mission. We see that from how Jesus responds to her, but in a way it's urgent. Let me just be very personal about weddings for a minute. I have had opportunity to perform some weddings in my time, and it's about the most stressful thing I ever do. I would rather preach or teach almost any other context than a wedding. Why? It's not because I don't like weddings, don't want people getting married. No, I love weddings, but to be the officiant 
is stressful because, well, let me put it this way. If I mess up in a sermon, I can always have another crack at it the next week. But if you mess up in a wedding, it's on video forever, and you'll always be known as the one who messed up the wedding. There is so much focus on every little detail of a wedding. I know it's that way in the 21st century, and I suppose it was that way in the 1st century, where mothers and mothers-in-law and brothers and sisters and bridegrooms, we know they had bridegrooms, and they had all, this is obviously a big celebration. Historians will tell us it could last a week, so they may even put more emphasis on the events surrounding the ceremony than we do. That's a pressure-packed situation. I remember right before Becca and I were getting married, one of my groomsmen, who will remain nameless, just couldn't be found. He, had just, he was just AWOL. And it's a little bit stressful because you only have a brief period of time to take those pictures. Are the pictures important? Has anybody invested any money in the pictures before the wedding happens? Has the photographer traveled maybe hundreds of miles to come and take the pictures? And then one of the people who's supposed to be in those pictures forevermore, for generations who will look back at those pictures, one of them is not there. Or maybe one of them forgot the appropriate pants that he's supposed to wear at the thing. I don't want to get into too much detail, but it nearly derailed the pictures, folks. It just did. That's how it goes. But anyway, I bring all that up just to say, when Jesus' mother comes to him with a request that may at first seem like, it's not that big a deal. So you run out of wine. Get something else. Uh, Weddings are a different environment. And she comes with a stressful moment and says, these hosts are in the position of being quite embarrassed because they've invited all these people to come in and to provide this feast for them, and they have run out of wine. What does this teach us by way of our own practical day-to-day living? What about taking our problems to Jesus? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. Does that include the little cares as well as the big cares? And anyway, don't Christians accomplish the work of the Lord mostly in little moments? For example, giving a cup of cold water to someone who needs it, Matthew 10, 42. What about parents accomplishing the work of the Lord by having little daily conversations with their children when nobody else knows about it, Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. What about doing something to help some Christian who's feeling discouraged, encouraging one another day by day while it is called today, Hebrews 3.13? What about recognizing that we are just but earthen vessels? We have treasures in earthen vessels, 2 Corinthians 4.7. And in a way, everything we do in life compared to what God does is insignificant. But because God places his image within us, everything we do in service to him is significant. And so here Mary comes with a request that in one way may seem insignificant, but from another perspective it was quite important. And Jesus honors her request in caring for these people who are about to be embarrassed by actually doing what she asks. So let's continue then. We've seen the request. What about the hour? Let's look at the hour. Verse 4, And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? Or what is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. First of all, that word woman is interesting. If we read it in English, it comes across a little bit harsh, I think. But it doesn't in Greek because in John 19, 26 and 27, Jesus uses the very same word when he says one of his most tender things to his, to his mother when he says, Woman, behold your son. You remember pointing out that John was going to take care of her. That's one of the reasons we know that John was dead. I mean that uh, Joseph was dead by then, Joseph, Jesus' father, because otherwise Jesus would not have entrusted the care of his mother to one of the apostles. He would have entrusted her to her husband. But he doesn't do that. Maybe Joseph was already dead by this time. He's certainly not mentioned in this passage. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But here he says, woman, what have I to do with you? And I don't know if Jesus had an ironical look on his face. I wish I could have seen how Jesus said this. Because it seems as though Jesus says no. And yet Mary takes it as a yes. As soon as Jesus makes the statement that appears to come across as a negative answer and even a little bit of a reproach, like, uh, what does this have to do with me and you? I mean, my hour has not yet come. He must have said that 
somehow in such a way that she got the impression the answer is really yes. It may sound like a no, but it's really a yes. And so this was a kind statement. People really will harp on Jesus for using the word woman here. For example, I was talking to a professed Christian, not a member of the Lord's church, but a professing Christian this past week who was talking about his interactions with some Muslims. And one Muslim in particular, and you know Muslims believe that Jesus lived, and they believe that Jesus was a good man and a prophet. He just wasn't the son of God, which by the way is an impossible position. We'll talk about that later, but you cannot believe that Jesus was a good man and a prophet and not believe that he's the son of God. You've got to pick. Either he's the son of God or he's a terrible man, or he's a lunatic. That's another possibility. But if he's not a lunatic and he's not a terrible man, then he's God in the flesh. Anyway, that's another discussion. But the Muslim was talking to this uh, professed Christian, and he said, Jesus was a really good man, and he was even a prophet, but you know he dishonored his mother. And he cited John chapter 2 as evidence for Jesus violating Old Testament passages that teach that children ought to honor their parents, not least of which is in the Ten Commandments themselves, part of the law for the Jews. In Exodus chapter 18, where it's very strict about how children are to honor father and mother, you're familiar with those passages. Well, the answer is Mary obviously did not take offense at what Jesus said. She didn't even shrink from her request in the least. She took it as emboldening for Jesus to say, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. What about that hour? Well, the hour refers to, at least in the initial stages, Jesus beginning a miraculous ministry of signs, which in the long term would result in his crucifixion, which was his glorification. This is a bigger study than we have time to do right now. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus repeatedly refers to his hour. And he says up until the raising of Lazarus that his hour has not come. His hour has not yet come. The time when he was going to be crucified and glorified had not yet come. But then after John 11, in John 12 and 13 and 17, Jesus refers to his hour as being present. In fact, when he begins the high priestly prayer in John 17, he says to his father, the hour has come, glorify the son. And so this refers, this hour refers to his crucifixion ultimately. But perhaps here it refers to Jesus saying, the beginning of my signs, which ultimately will result in my execution, has not yet come. And apparently Jesus and Mary had had some discussions. Mary knowing who Jesus is. Don't you know that Mary was aware, more than anybody in the world, I suppose, except for maybe John the Baptist, Mary was aware of Jesus' true identity. And Mary undoubtedly was waiting for the time when the inbreaking of Jesus' kingdom would be announced to the world. And maybe that's exactly what Jesus is talking about when he smiles at her, maybe even winks at her, and says, my hour has not yet come. And she says, it's time to begin the miraculous ministry of Jesus, and he's going to start by taking care of this wine problem at the wedding. So here is the request that Mary makes. Now let's look at the command. Look at the command, verses 5 through 8. His mother, this is Mary, said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification. That's hand washing, and the size of these water pots varies, but most scholars are going to tell you it's 150 or 160 gallons of water in total. This is a ton of water that you could have if you filled up all of these water pots for your hand washing. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. Mary says to these attendants, whatever he says, do it. Shouldn't that be the overriding ethical norm for every person living? Whatever Jesus says, do it. 
Jesus said in John 12, 48, the words that I have spoken, the same will judge you in the last day. So the words that Jesus speaks, when Jesus says do something, that is a word that will be the standard for our judgment when this life is over. Notice that she says whatever he says, do it. Don't leave out anything. And so we ought to look very carefully at everything Jesus said, and not only what Jesus said, but what his authorized representatives, the apostles and the inspired writers in the New Testament said. We should look at everything they said and ask ourselves, are we doing everything, whatever they said, that applies to us, we must be doing it. And that's one of the things we said about the eldership this morning as we talked about the qualifications for elders. If they are above reproach and blameless and just and devout, as those qualifications say, then they'll be doing whatever the Bible says that applies to them. But that ought to be true of every one of us. We should ask ourselves, honestly, is there any command that Jesus has given or that Paul or Peter or James or John has given that applies to me as a 21st century Christian. Now this command in particular doesn't apply to me. This command, fill the water pots with water. You're not required to have any water pots and you're not required to fill them with water or to wash your hands at any particular time. That's not your law for you. But whatever Jesus or Paul or James or John or the, the apostolic writers said that applies to you, are you doing it? Or have you left something out? Are you leaving something out? You know, it does no good for somebody who gets pulled over for speeding to appeal to the police officer and say, I know I sped, but I haven't murdered anybody today. Or I know I sped, but I haven't stolen anything today. That's not the issue. The question is, did you obey the law about speed on the highway? That's the only question that concerns well, see, we've got to look at the law of Christ as something where we must obey all of it. And there's grace for when we fail. We're not saying a person can't be forgiven for failures. But we must not rebelliously say, I know God says this, but I don't care. I'm not going to do it. Mary leads these people to Jesus and says, and this is the right principle, whatever he says, do it. And isn't that, for somebody living today, an expression of love for God? Sometimes obedience and love are isolated as if they're two separate ideas. You can either love God or you can focus on obedience. But don't they really go together? If someone you love asks you to do something, isn't it your desire to do it because you want to please them? Jesus said, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I've commanded you. If you love me, keep my commandments. If we love him, we will do whatever he said. And that's what comes up in this conversation. So there's the command. Now let's look at the miracle itself in verses 9 and 10. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine, the miracle has occurred, and did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Well, what exactly did Jesus make in this case? It's tricky at least at first, because the word that's translated wine, as we mentioned this morning when we talked about the elder qualification not given to wine, is the ordinary Greek word oinos, which is referring to non-intoxicating grape juice and intoxicating alcoholic beverage. And on this slide, I've given you some verses in the Old Testament Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament where the word oinos occurs, and the Greek New Testament. And in both cases, you can find verses that clearly are referring to non-intoxicating oinos and intoxicating oinos in both Old and New Testament. So I bring that up just to say the mere occurrence of the word wine in this passage says nothing about whether it's intoxicating or non-intoxicating because the word can refer to either. What we have to do is look at the context and see what's being referred to based on the immediate words surrounding the use of oinos, and then the larger biblical context, everything else the Bible says on the subject. And I think when we do, we'll find that there is no way, as we might say in Alabama, there ain't no way that Jesus made intoxicating beverages. Let me go ahead and put my cards on the table about that. He did not do that. But how do we know he didn't do it? Some people will say, oh, it's impossible that Jesus 
and the other people at this feast were drinking non-intoxicating grape juice because they didn't have a way to avoid fermentation. Back in the ancient world, grape juice was fermented in every circumstance like this because they were so primitive, they did not have a way to avoid fermentation. But that's simply wrong. In fact, looking at historical sources, I've made a list of the various ways they could do it. They could harvest the grapes late. They could press the grapes gently. So let's not look at that just yet. Okay, I've got the list on here. Good. They could harvest the grapes late. They could press them gently so as to separate the juice from the yeast and then put it in a sealed container so that fermentation would be delayed or avoided altogether. They could boil it. Virgil, the Roman historian, mentions boiling the grape juice so that you could avoid drinking alcoholic beverages. Notice what one commentator named Andreas J. Kostenberger in his commentary on John wrote about this subject. In the Greco-Roman world, and presumably in the Palestine of Jesus' day, three kinds of wine were in use. Fermented wines, number one, which usually were mixed in the proportion of two to three parts water to one of wine. Number two, new wine made of grape juice and similar to cider, not fermented. And number three, wines in which by boiling the unfermented grape juice, the process of fermentation had been stopped and the formation of alcohol prevented. So here is a case where someone's saying, you perfectly well could have non-intoxicating wine in the first century. Notice what Pliny the Elder wrote. He said, wines are most beneficial when all their potency has been removed by the strainer. Now, here's somebody who lived and died, uh, lived uh, during the age of Jesus and died shortly thereafter. And he says, wines are most beneficial when their potency has been removed by the strainer. Or what about Plutarch? The historian Plutarch, he wrote, a Greek philosopher from shortly after the time of Christ, he wrote, in like manner, purging of wine takes from it all the strength that inflames and enrages the mind and gives it instead thereof a mild and wholesome temper. So here's boiling the wine and purging the wine of that which would make it intoxicating. Furthermore, they had refrigeration techniques. You can read about ancient people taking a liquid and refrigerating it by putting it in a cold place, underground, like in a cellar, or even in cool running water. So refrigeration, even though they didn't have the modern techniques that we have, was not unknown to them. And even though fermentation did occur in a lot of beverages that they had back then, you can certainly read about people getting drunk. There were lots of people getting drunk, but it is a mistake to compare the average table wine that people used in the first century with fortified, distilled wine that people have today. In fact, as I mentioned this morning, very often alcohol was used to purify water so that it wouldn't have dangerous bacteria. Well, they wouldn't have known about bacteria, but they would have known about purifying water so that they would use just enough alcohol to make the water safe to drink but not to get anybody intoxicated. Notice what one of the intertestamental books, 2 Maccabees chapter 15 and verse 39 says. It says, it is harmful to drink wine alone, or again, to drink water alone, while wine mixed with water is sweet and delicious and enhances one's enjoyment. So, remembering that modern methods of distillation And fermentation, I mean, and a fortification where additional alcohol content is added to the wine that people drink at their tables today were unknown in ancient times. And recognizing the need to purify water that had dangerous bacteria, such as we face when we go to a third world country on a mission trip, you can see that the biblical explanation about wine is perfect for sending the message that social drinking and drinking intoxicating beverages is wrong per Ephesians 5.18 and 1 Peter 4.3, but there were legitimate uses of grape juice, drinking grape juice for enjoyment, such as what Jesus made here, and also to keep one safe. So I think that's a very balanced picture of what the Bible says on this matter. And thus, in this case, we would suggest Jesus made grape juice. But it's not only that. Notice that Jesus never violated the Old Testament. 
Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. What does the Old Testament say about the danger of drinking beverage alcohol? I'm about to read Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35. As I read it, ask yourself, given the dangers of alcohol described in this passage, did Jesus make 160 gallons of it for people to drink at a wedding feast after they had been drinking a ton of alcohol already? That's the picture that you would have to adopt if you say that Jesus made fermented intoxicating beverage. You'd have to say that these people have been drinking and drinking and drinking beverage alcohol and Jesus made a lot more of it for them to get even more drunk. That's the picture that would have to obtain if Jesus made the intoxicating beverage. Let's read it together. Keeping in mind Hebrews 4.15. He was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. Who hath woe? I'm reading out of the King James Version here. I think it's the best translation of this part. Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Notice that the Proverbs writer conclusion is not that we should drink a little and see if we can avoid getting drunk. His perspective of it is don't drink it at all. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth on the top of the mast, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. So he's imagining things. He's sick at his stomach because he feels like he's on a ship. He's intoxicated. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Well, the fact that the people had drunk freely at this feast is no indication that they were already intoxicated. The phrase translated drunk freely can indicate that they had just drunk their fill or that they had had a lot of this grape juice to drink. It in no way indicates that they were intoxicated. It's just that they had had a good bit of grape juice already to drink. There's no indication about drunkenness in that phrase. So based upon all these remarks... I think we can say with confidence that people who try to justify drinking alcohol on the basis that, hey, Jesus made some wine, are simply ignorant about the matter. I, I don't mean to be unkind, but they have just not studied the background of the passage. They have not studied the overall biblical context, and they're taking a verse where Jesus made something, but it's very clear what he made, to say that he made something else, and that even justifies drinking stronger stuff than was even imagined in the day when Jesus would have made that alcoholic drink, if he did. Now in the last place, let's look at the result of this miracle that Jesus performed. Verse 11, this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the only place in the Bible when we read about this, where we read about this sign is in John chapter 2. And Jesus accomplished his purpose. Even in this first one, which is quite different from many of the other signs that Jesus performed in the Gospel of John and in the synoptics, Jesus accomplished his mission, which was to produce belief. And as we began tonight saying that you have in the Gospel of John enough evidence to prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be, I wonder if you're convinced about that. And if you're ready to say, well, Jesus is the Lord, not just based on the miracle at Cana, but the raising of Lazarus, other miracles that Jesus performed, and ultimately his own resurrection from the dead. Jesus' ministry of redemption on earth started with a wedding. And in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8 and 17 and 18, Revelation 19, 7 through 18. We read about another wedding. And it's the wedding supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. When the bride of Christ will celebrate the consummation of all its hope in heaven with God forever and ever. Ephesians 5 says that the bride in a, a human wedding is to be compared to the church. Marrying the perfect husband, Jesus and then they will go and be together forever, living happily ever after in heaven after the marriage supper of the Lamb. So you can see that the redemptive work of Jesus is bookended by weddings. 
It starts with the wedding in Cana when he does the first of his public signs. And it will end, as we may say, in heaven when the church, the bride of Christ, goes home to be with the perfect husband, Jesus, forever and ever. But only people who are part of that bride get to go home with the Lord. And the question is, are you? How do you get to be a part of the bride of Christ so you can be married to him and celebrate with him forever in heaven? The answer is to be a member of his church. And the church, according to that same passage in Ephesians 5, 25 and following that talks about the church as the bride of Christ, says that the bride is that group of people who have been washed by the water with the word. And all that simply means is people who have been baptized for the remission of sins according to the teaching of the word of God. Does that describe you? Or maybe you need to be restored to faithfulness. You became part of the bride of Christ, but you've committed spiritual adultery on him because you've gone off and served the devil. And now you want to come back home and he will take you back. And the church would love to restore you to faithfulness as Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says we must. Or maybe you want the prayers of the church for another reason. Come now as together we stand and while we sing. All things are ready, come to the feast, come for the table now is spread, ye number 216 to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. If you need a communion packet, go ahead and raise your hand now. And while we sing this song, um, one of the ushers will bring you on number 216. He leadeth me, oh blessed thought, oh words with heavenly comfort. by 
Supper, I will be reading John chapter 3, verses 18 through 17. John chapter 3, verses 18 through 17, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. If you would, bow with me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time that we're able to gather together as your church and that we're able to memorialize this feast that represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for our salvation. Lord, at this time we focus upon the bread that represents his body that was hung on that tree that was broken for our sins. Lord, we ask you please help us to partake of this in a worthy manner. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Please bow again. Dear Father in heaven, as we come before your throne again in humble prayer, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessing of your Son and especially the blood that was shed on that cross of Calvary for each and every one of us. At this time, as we prepare to take of the fruit of the vine that represents that blood, we ask that you please help us to take of it in a worthy manner. And it is in your Son's name that we pray. Amen.
each first day of the week that we come together to worship God, part of our worship is to, we've been commanded to lay by and store, to give purposefully give back a part of our blessings that we've been blessed with. Our scripture reading this evening will be Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before thee now thanking you for all the many material blessings that we are blessed with. Father, we know we are extremely blessed people. We pray, Father, that we will give back a portion of those blessings to help the work of the church. We pray, Father, that you would be with the elders, that they might use these funds in the most effective way they can for the works of the church and to bring lost souls to thy kingdom. Father, again, we thank you for each and every blessing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. My name is Travis Johnson, and I am one of the deacons in Group 3. And my new task is the upkeep of, as well as the scheduling of volunteers to work our Welcome Center. And Chris Ramey has been leading this task for quite a while now, and he's done a great job and has always kept it running smoothly. So I'm going to be trying my best to, to pick up where Chris left off. The Welcome Center is currently located in the Echo Room part of our building, as it has been for several years. But it will very soon be moved to a new location, which will be in our main lobby. And it will be just outside between the middle and right set of auditorium doors. The purpose of the Welcome Center is to provide a warm and inviting entrance for visitors and newcomers into our building. I believe this congregation has always provided that and I hope that we will continue to do so for many years to come. And so I am seeking volunteers to help man the, the new Welcome Center. Volunteers who will will greet visitors and newcomers warmly, who will be able to guide and direct visitors to the appropriate Bible class, who will be able to guide visitors to uh, a restroom or the nursery or provide any information that may be needed. The Dorcas Ministry is, is jumping in as, as well to help, and they are preparing gift bags that workers of the Welcome Center will hand to visitors. And the gift bags will contain items and information that are related to our congregation. We are hoping to have, we are, we're planning and hoping to have the, the new Welcome Center in its, in its new location with its new signage and fully staffed by March 3rd, March 3rd being the first Sunday in the month of March. I've started contacting some members already, ask, asking for help. Uh, members that have been recommended by, by, by the elders to me, and I will continue to contact some of you throughout the next several weeks. But we need your help. If you are currently working the Welcome Center, I hope that you will continue to do so. And maybe you worked the Welcome Center in the past, but for some reason stopped, maybe because of, of COVID or, or whatever reasons. I hope you will give some thought into coming back and helping out again. If you are interested in helping, whether you are single, married, maybe you would like to work with a friend, maybe your whole family would like to be involved, there is a sign-up sheet that has been posted on the congregational bulletin board in the hallway. Please, please feel free to sign up. We would love to have that sign-up sheet full of names so we could make sure that this, this new Welcome Center will be up and running quickly and smoothly. And, um, or you could just 
see me after service or see me whenever and let me know that you're interested. We also already have a group on the Lightpost app, which we will attempt to do most of our communicating and reminding through. So, so please, please, if you're interested at all in helping with the Welcome Center, please sign up on the sign-up sheet in the hallway or get with me. Or if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Most of the time, I have the opportunity to welcome new members. Tonight is a welcome home. Welcome home. Roy and Miranda Adair uh, left here in 2019 and moved toward East Tennessee. And uh, we're grateful that they are now back with us. Uh, Roy is a customer center manager for Dayton Freight. Right now, they're currently living in a rental house because they are building a new home that's not quite ready yet. So with them, we'll have two addresses to place in the bulletin. They have two children, Casey and Blake, and we are grateful that they are back with us. They're going to be in group one. So welcome home and stand for those who've not yet met you. We are so glad that you're back here with us. You can sit down now. <laughs> this has been a great night. Thank you, Caleb, for your message tonight. Please pass your cards to the aisles. Those will be picked up by our ushers. We need to remember Michael and Angela Tanksley and their family and our thoughts and in our prayers right now. Angela's grandfather, Kenneth Heimer, passed away this morning in Kansas. He was also the great-grandfather of Allison, Mallory, and Parker Tanksley. Arrangements are incomplete at this time, but let's keep this family in our prayers. The Fabulous 50s will be having dinner at Jason's Deli right after our services end tonight. The ladies of the young adults will be having a devotional at the home of Haley Betts tomorrow night. The prime timers will be going to Rachel's Diner in Humboldt on Friday, February the 23rd. If you'd like to attend this, you are asked to sign up by this Wednesday night. And the ladies of the 30 and 40-somethings are invited to a Bible study next Saturday, February the 24th at 9 a.m. at the home of Rose Banks. If you'd like to attend this, you're asked to sign up by this Wednesday night. And ladies of the congregation, you're invited to a bridal, bridal shower honoring Mo Molly Alban, bride-elect of Josh Hertzka. On Sunday, February the 25th, Molly and Josh are registered at Target. If you have questions or having any kind of trouble with the light post out, next Sunday afternoon at 5.30, if you'll come to the ladies' classroom, there'll be someone there who can assist you with any of those questions. And congratulations to Clarita McKee on the birth of her great-great-granddaughter, Clara Grace Chamberlain, was born Monday, February the 5th. Proud parents are Joe and Kara Chamberlain, so we are happy for Miss Clarita. And those are all the announcements that I have tonight. We're going to be led in one more song, and then Mike Welch will come lead us in a closing prayer. Hope everyone has a great week. And again, to all of our visitors, thank you so much for choosing to be with us at North Jackson tonight. We hope you'll come back and see us every opportunity that you have. Let's stand. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, while his ransomed ones we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss. And to crown him king, toil and sing, neath the banner of the cross. Bow with me, please. Kind Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that you have blessed us with. We thank you 
the opportunity we've had to be here today to worship and to study from your word. We thank you for the congregation of people that meets here. Thank you for our elders. We ask that you be with them and guide them as they lead us. As we begin this new week, we ask that you go with us all and help us to be the people you would have us to be and forgive us when we fall short. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. It's through him we pray. Amen. <laughs> 